Okay, well, welcome back from the break. The democratic nations of the world defeated fascism in World War II. And since then, many have entered into various kinds of alliances, such as the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the G7, and many others. And while these nations don't always agree on everything, many have suggested that due to their shared values, interests, and history of collaboration, that bringing those nations together could be the best first step in creating a world federation. Our next speaker, Chris Hamer, has been a leader in that approach. By profession, Chris was a theoretical physicist before retiring from the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. His research explored the interface between particle physics and statistical mechanics. Chris has published over 140 papers in peer-reviewed scientific journals. Chris has had a long-standing interest in issues concerning nuclear disarmament and global governance. He founded the World Citizens Association in Australia. He was the National Secretary of Scientists Against Nuclear Arms in Australia. He's President of Scientists for Global Responsibility, also in Australia. He's been a member, excuse me, he's been an academic board member of the Association to Unite the Democracies. And most recently, Chris is president of the Coalition for a World Security Community of Democratic Nations. Chris published a book entitled A Global Parliament, Principles of World Federation, and established university courses in nuclear arms and, excuse me, entitled Nuclear Arms and the New World Order and International Governance in the 21st Century. As with all of our speakers, Chris will, be, will present for about 30 to 35 minutes and will continue to take questions after that. If you place your questions in the chat box, we'll proceed as we have been doing. So in a moment, I will put the link to the website for the Coalition for a World Security Community of Democratic Nations in the chat window. But now it's my pleasure to introduce Chris Hamer. Chris? Chris, you may be on mute. I think we lost Chris. I had made oh. him a host. I had made him a co-host, but he's, I don't see him. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. I will have um, to assume he will be on in a moment. Yes. We can do a quick tangle lesson while we're- All, all you missed is your introduction. <laughs> my apologies. So my machine went low on power and switched itself off right oh. at the- time I was trying to go into the meeting. So I'm, I apologize for that. So are we ready for my talk? Yeah, we're all, yes. we're all ready for you. Just a minute. Let, I'd like to use a PowerPoint. Yes, screen, uh, you should be able to. You should be able to share your screen. Right. Um, Great. We were starting to read your theoretical physics papers. <laughs> okay, um, there we go. Now, how do I get back to my, well, anyway. Can you see the screen? No, you no, have to hit the it. blue share button again. So you might have hit the green share and then you, then oh. once you select the window you wanna share, you have to find the blue, usually on the lower right and hit that blue button. Right, okay. It's a two-step process. Blue. Wait on, I have to go back to, I beg your pardon. Um, oh, where's the full screen? Um, are you stuck in the full screen or are you at looking at the beginning? Oh, it was trying to we get don't a PowerPoint on. We don't see anything yet. We see that you're sharing your screen, but I don't know what you're sharing. At least I don't see it. Does anyone see it? No, not yet. It's black. I don't see it, but uh, I see that it is a share. Um, oh. You got it. We got it. You got it. Okay. I got it. Okay. So I beg your pardon for all that rubbish. Anyway, it can happen to anybody, I suppose. So first of all, let me thank um, Bob and Donna for the chance to um, present my case today. Um, and really, I said earlier, I'd like to congratulate them for this 
initiative for the um, Powers to World Federation. Uh, I think it's a great idea and um, hopefully it um, can be a step towards relaunching the, the movement generally after the recent disasters. Anyway, uh, I want to talk about the path of uniting the democracies. And we have a transnational working group um, advocating a world security community of democratic nations, which is um, a, an initiative along this path. Uh, and before starting, let me say, as Donna emphasized at the beginning of the meeting, I suppose, since nobody knows which path will of the five paths or more, which will ultimately succeed, we should all support each other along our different paths. And so just for instance, we um, uh, supported Andres Bummel in a visit out to Australia in 2018 to promote his idea of a UN parliamentary assembly. Nevertheless, as I say, I'll give reasons why I think this path is the one most likely to succeed. So just in summary, I've got um, six slides basically. First of all, the history of the idea, which goes back, I guess, to the Atlantic movement. Um, secondly, the long-term motivation, which is from a world federalist perspective as a step towards um, better global governance, or in fact, uh, I'm on the line, um, um, a world federation. And thirdly, um, I'd like to look again at the European example. So Fernando has just taken us through that to some extent. Uh, fourthly, I'd give a very brief outline of our scheme. Fifthly, I'll talk about the immediate motivation, which is um, countering autocracy, in particular the current threat from China, I guess, to be frank. And lastly, I'll talk about the current opportunities. So it hopefully leads into the um, discussions at the Summit for Democracy next month. Okay, so let me begin. History. Well, the Atlantic movement. So it started, I guess, um, with Clarence Streit, who was a journalist and wrote a book in 1939 called Union Now, calling for a union of the North Atlantic democracies, basically to combat uh, fascism and the threat from Hitler. Uh, the book sold 300,000 copies. Um, it started a popular movement. I think, I believe Wendell Wilkie, who was a presidential candidate, wrote a similar book or a book on a similar subject, which sold 2 million copies in the middle of the war. Anyway, started a movement. Um, after the war, he wrote a new edition of his book calling for a union of democracies to um, fight communism, the Soviet Union, which seemed to be a threat at the time. And his final edition, um, I forget what year, but, but he said one of the main purposes was to create by its constitution a nucleus world government capable of growing into a universal world government peacefully and as rapidly as such growth will best serve mankind's freedom. So he was, you know, that's almost current. That's um, almost a statement of world federalism. Um, as I say, so his ideas resonated with people. Um, there was a Atlantic Union Committee set up in 1949, which included um, distinguished people like Owen Roberts, a former Justice of the Supreme Court, William Clayton, who was a diplomat, I believe, and a um, bureaucrat credited with um, producing the Marshall Plan or formulating the Marshall Plan. Um, the formation of NATO, I suppose, could be regarded as an, an outgrowth of the movement. The North, North American Treaty Organization. In 1957, there was an influential book by um, some academics of note, Carl Deutsch et al, called Political Community in the North Atlantic Area. And um, the movement continued with ups and downs, I suppose. In 2006-07, 
um, after 9-11, there were calls for a League of Democracies um, by John McCain, a presidential candidate again, or a concert of dem democracies um, led by Ivo Dalda, a former ambassador to the UN, I think, or NATO, was it? And academics at Princeton, etc. James Lindsay, Anne-Marie Slaughter, John Eikenberry, and John Davenport, who's actually a member of our working group. And um, at the present day, there are various organizations out there as part of this movement. There's the Atlantic Council in the US and the Alliance of Democracies Foundation in Europe, which, um, let me say, are better staffed and have more resources than uh, our World Federalist Movement, I'm afraid. But um, I guess the hope is we might be able to bring them all together. OK, the long-term motivation. Um, we all, all know this. We're all World Federalists here. Uh, we know that humanity in general faces some very serious global challenges. Global warming, top of the list at the moment. Nuclear weapons, we've heard um, the doomsday clock is 100 seconds to midnight. Um, great seas of plastic in the oceans. The refugee crisis, there's 80 million refugees or displaced persons out there, a number greater than the population of France. Um, species going extinct at a rapid rate and so on. So it's obvious we all need to work together if we're to solve these problems. And as I say, it's the function of government to meet the needs and solve the problems of society at any level, whether it's the local level, the national level, the regional or the global level. So therefore, to deal effectively with these problems, we really need some form of world government or in particular, a democratic world federation. Uh, we have the U present UN, which is universal organization, and it's a step along the path, a big step, but it's not good enough, it's not sufficient. And I guess all of us here uh, agree so far, I hope. Now, we've been campaigning for a democratic world federation ever since World War II, um, without success so far. And in fact, I believe the Europe I'm sorry, the movement reached its peak in about 1947, when there were hundreds of thousands of members worldwide. And um, it declined under the pressure of the Cold War, I suppose. Everybody hoped it would revive when the Cold War ended. But um, it doesn't seem to have done to any major extent so far. So, and well, let me say that we've um, concentrated on trying to transform the UN, I suppose, traditionally, which is an obvious route. We'll hear more about that tomorrow. Um, and the UN Charter itself provides for a Charter Review Conference every 10 years or so, but no Charter Review Conference has ever been convened, probably because um, in practice, in, you know, any review would not be approved. It would be likely vetoed by one of the permanent members. So we need to be clever. We need to find better ways forward. Um, and well, our thinking is, first of all, democracy has to be a basic principle of any world federation um, to avoid any possibility of world tyranny or a world autocracy, which would be an absolute catastrophe for the world. And um, I believe surveys show that a third of the world's population immediately dismiss any mention of world government or world federation because of the fear of tyranny. They, they've all read 1984 or um, Brave New World. And the idea of world government raises images of jackboots and swastikas and um, world tyranny. So democracy has to be a basic principle, as Fernando emphasized also. But there we strike a major problem. Um, universality and democracy are not compatible at the present time. Not all nations of the world are democratic. 
maybe one third are fully de democratic, and one third are partially democratic, and one third are not democratic at all, according to Freedom House. Well, so how do we go forward? Um, Europe, as Fernando says, has set us an example at the regional level. So um, as he said, at the end of World War II, that was the fifth major war, I think, between France and Germany in 200 years. And far-sighted people around Europe recognized that this nuisance had to stop. And the way to do it was um, to integrate the nations of Europe. And so Jean Monnet and his collaborators uh, decided they needed a European federation, basically. And that was their strategy all along. But again, they couldn't do it in one jump. Um, their strategy was to start small with the original six members with a limited objective, the European coal and steel community to um, integrate the sinews of war, if you like, and look to achieve the final objective of European Federation in stages. So we've seen the stages they've succeeded in doing the Treaty of Paris, Treaty of Rome, EEC, Treaty of Maastricht, uh, the EU. They still haven't reached their final declaration, but they their final destination, sorry, but they've gone a long way towards it. And um, in the Schumann Declaration, which is the founding document of the EU, um, they explicitly declare the objective is eventual world, uh, European Federation, but they say Europe will not be built all at once or according to a single plan. So that seems to me an excellent strategy. Um, how should we do it on the global scale? Um, who are the small number of progressive nations we should start with? And what should be their objective? Well, if democracy is a vital principle, we should start with democracies. So um, we should start with a group of democracies. And as an immediate objective, we're proposing common security because um, that seems under threat at the moment, it's a worry. So let's work on common security, the first responsibility of any government to keep the people safe. So we formed a so-called coalition for world security community of democratic nations. Um, this is, I should have quoted this before, but um, I like to quote H.C. Wells in his outline of history of 1922. There can be little question that the attainment of a federation of all humanity together with a sufficient measure of social justice to ensure health, education, and a rough measure of equality of opportunity to most of the children born into the world would mean such a release and increase of human energy as to open a new phase in human history. And that's still true. So our proposal, um, the bare bones, start with a, a community on the European model of democracies. Uh, for instance, with the um, Supreme Council of Heads of State, maybe, um, a Council of Ministers to look after particular issues, a commission or a cabinet to direct bureaucracy, et cetera, et cetera. And um, as far as possible, it should use qualified majority voting in the uh, organization to um, ensure, well, to avoid the problem of veto. So one single member to install action by all the others by vetoing a proposition. Um, and the idea again is it could evolve stage by stage, treaty and treaty, over time to become our desired democratic world federation. Um, it should include a parliamentary assembly which would be the, an assembly of parliamentarians from the member states, which would eventually evolve like as in Europe again, to become an, a genuine elected world parliament. It should include a court to um, settle any disputes between members, 
which would be the prototype of an eventual global legal system. And um, particular items here, it, the members should uh, make binding commitments to defend each other from any external attacks. So it would be, this is the security aspect. It would be basically an alliance of the members. Um, to keep each other safe. And as regards non-members, um, there should be a binding commitment not to undertake military actions or in or against non-member states unless authorised to do so by the Security Council. And that's just um, international law at the moment. So that's the bare bones of the proposal. Um, it would have to be, you know, settled. The details would have to be settled by some sort of commission or convention. Uh, the advantages. Um, it should be able to give a virtually ironclad guarantee of security for all its members um, if, if it involved all the major democracies around the world. Um, it, would probably form a close partnership with the UN in peacekeeping and peace building in non-member states, if you like. Um, it'd be able to provide resources, um, military facilities, and greatly strengthen peace building in the world. It should um, allot structural adjustment funds as in Europe to attract new members to build it build members up to the same level of economic development, et cetera, under the principle of solidarity. Um, it would hopefully, well, the commitment to only undertake military actions under, as authorised by the Security Council should be able to avoid a new Cold War. And uh, I would say it's a big step forward towards our objective better global governance or a democratic world federation. So that's the bare bones of our proposal. Um, you can see more at our website, which is given at the bottom there, uh, worldsecuritycommunity.org. You're halfway through your time, Chris. Okay, I'm doing well. Um, the immediate motivation, uh, countering autocracy. So, I mean, being frank here, in recent years, we've seen President Xi in China, I would say, exhibit the classic signs of an absolute autocrat or dictator. So all the autocracies, I suppose, have military parades with straight arm salutes and flags and marches and missiles and so on. But beyond that, we've seen a million Uyghurs locked up in Xinjiang, Xinjiang or whatever it is, in re-education, so-called, or concentration camps. We've seen um, crackdown, stern repression of any dissent in China, punished by imprisonment or death. We've seen um, democracy wiped out in Hong Kong not long ago, and we could do nothing about it. We've seen China fortifying these islets in the South China Sea within the nine dashed line in defiance of international law. There was a international court, I forget exactly which one, which ruled there it was illegal. They've ignored that. Uh, President Xi is engaged in making himself present for life. Um, he's undertaking another five year term as we speak. And then the immediate threat. Um, he has explicitly promised to reunify Taiwan with the mainland, the, the bright, vibrant democracy in Taiwan, by force if necessary. And he's pledged it will be done by 2048, which is the 100th anniversary of the communist takeover in um, China. But analysts estimate he will in, in present circumstances, make an effort by 2028, um, when he's still in power, for instance. And I've seen some analyses saying he might be ready to go. I mean, we've all seen the signs. He's fortifying 
um, coastal runways opposite Taiwan. He's um, doing fly pass, you can name it. But they say he may be ready to go within three years. And meanwhile, the US and Japan have made public pledges that they will defend Taiwan against any attempt at um, military forcible takeover. But again, I've seen analysts say they might well lose the battle. I mean, it's on China's home turf to some extent in, in their region. So that's a rather worrying prospect, especially to those of us in the Asia Pacific region, you might say. <laughs> um, so what can we do about it? Well, it's again, clear that the world's democracies need to work together to counter this threat. And if they did form a formal alliance or community, uh, the major democracies dispose of two thirds of the world's GDP, two thirds of its military expenditure, which should be enough to deter China and make them decide not to undertake this military adventure. And um, so that's what we're proposing. We're proposing an explicit alliance for a world security community for this purpose. Present opportunity. Well, um, President Biden has uh, proposed or set up a summit for democracy in December, uh, 9th and the 10th, is it? And he stated the idea is a global summit for democracy to renew the spirit and shared purpose of the democracy of the nations of the world. I'm sorry, I can't quite see that bit. Um, it will bring together the world's democracies to strengthen our democratic institutions, honestly confront nations that are backsliding and forge a common agenda. So um, we're going to see a lot of activity before that and during that and after that. Um, we're organizing as we speak a webinar on no November the 30th, um, remove the question mark, uh, with the title of Summit for Democracy, A League of Democracies. Um, there's been organized a Global Democracy Coalition Forum by International IDEA, which is some sort of international intergovernmental group in December, just before the summit. And there's um, some working groups organized to provide civil society input to the group, to the summit by the US State Department. And they've, uh, we've joined a working group on countering authoritarianism. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of activity. Let me say, my impression is it's all rather disorganized at the moment. Um, I'm not sure the Summit for Democracy itself will lead to any um, major explicit developments at this stage, but the idea is it will, activity will carry on for the next year and there will be a second summit at the end of 1922. And we will hope that at the end of that process, um, something definite will emerge. Um, yeah, so I suppose I can show the last slide. So that's just um, a shot of our uh, proposal document. We've got about 40 working group members at the stage. Um, we, we were formally founded, I suppose, following the new shape forum in Stockholm in 2018, made a presentation at the Paris Peace Forum in um, the same year. And we're working as best we can um, to push the, the idea. So um, if you're interested, you can by all means look at our website. All right, thanks very much. Do I have to? Um, mute or something. Bob, are you have you're on mute, Bob? 
Okay, thank you. Yes, I started talking on mute. So yeah, so we have a few questions in the chat. So Chris, you need to unmute yourself so you can answer the questions. Okay, so the first question is, is in two parts. Uh, it was two, two separate postings. It's from Gail Hughes. The first part is simply, how is democracy defined? And the second part, which she adds later, is to add to my question above, a Princeton study ca categorized the US as an oligarchy rather than a democracy. If it is categorized as democracy by the Uniting the Democracies organization, I challenge the statement that democracy has to be a principle of any, of any world government to avoid the, po oh, it just jumped, excuse me, to avoid the possibility of world tyranny or autocracy. The US, not a country such as China or Saudi Arabia, is viewed by many around the world as the greatest uh, threat to world peace in a Gallup poll administered several years ago. So if you could respond to that. Um, I should have written it down. So- um, Okay, if you need to, you could open the chat. You can just bring your cursor down no, to the bottom. It's okay, I think I remember. Okay. Yes. So defining democracy, well, um, that would be up to the organization itself, I suppose, um, as the European Union does. So the European Union um, makes the principle of democracy one of its um, founding principles. So members have to uh, be a democracy to be admitted. Um, some of them have backslided, I suppose, and become problematic, but anyway. Um, so we could use the same criteria as that, or the principles criteria of Freedom House, um, uh, freely elected parliaments with um, oppositions allowed, you know, um, freedom of the press, dot, 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 all, all those standard um, criteria. But basically, it would be up to the original members to admit new members um, according to whatever criteria that they decide. The US, well, I mean, I've seen statements, um, but I, I'm, I reject the, I mean, democracy seemed to be under threat to some extent at, on December 6th, right, when um, uh, the electoral outcome was challenged. But um, the, I mean, I've spent seven years in the US myself, I think the institutions are very strong there, um, and they countered the threat. They, they survived the threat, and um, the election was validated. Um, so I, it's not perfect. No democracy is perfect. We go back to Winston Churchill, but it's better than all those other systems out there. So um, I just simply reject the idea that the US is not a democracy. OK. The next question comes from Byron Belitzos, which is- Oh, sorry, sorry oh. Bob, yes. one more thing. Yes. She said, um, I think that uh, the question said that um, the US was a, you know, maybe the greatest threat to peace in the world or whatever. Um, so our provision that the community can only interfere in non-member states with the Mission of the Security Council would um, remove that threat. So it could only undertake military adventures, if you like, um, under the authorization of the Security Council. So that would prevent some of the sort of um, problematic adventures, such as, um, I mean, uh, we've seen Afghanistan, we've seen um, Iraq, we've seen Libya. Libya was actually authorized by the Security Council, but it could have been done much, much better. So that it left chaos behind, I'm afraid. But anyway, um, so the Security Council would have the ultimate authority of that sort of thing. Right, thank so, you. Oh, no problem. The next question comes from Byron Belitzos, and he asks, might there be a way for, in quote, non-democratic nations to join the union on a provisional basis? the prestige of full membership might give them incentive to democratize, would it not? Exactly, brilliant, brilliant question, yes. So, um, you know, we, nothing's concrete here, but um, I would think we'd have a category of associate members. So these are member states who don't satisfy all the criteria for full membership, 
but um, do promise to abide, abide by the um, um, provisions or the principles of the treaty, the founding treaty. So they would have to commit not to commit aggression, not, not to um, invade other countries, etc. Um, but they would be admitted as associate members. Um, and hopefully they would be able to upgrade over time. They would, my idea would be that they don't get these structural adjustment funds. So they would have this um, incentive to become full members because then they would have access to these structural adjustment funds. So yes, I think that'd be an excellent idea. Great, thank you. Let me just ask everybody as I did yesterday, I'm trying to sort out what are actually questions for Chris versus comments to the whole group. Uh, some things look more to me like a comment. There were two from you, Holly, that, that look like comments to the group. But let me ask everyone to not put comments in right now, just their questions to Chris, so it's easy to sort out. Um, and, and Holly, if those are questions to Chris, if you can restate them as questions. Thank you. So moving on down, um, the... Um, Okay, there's one, okay, from Byron. Okay, so hold on, I just need to see if these are actually questions or comments to the group that are already in. Okay, now that looks like a comment to the group. Okay, that's comments to the group. Please hold your comments to the group. I'm looking for questions. Or objections. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Okay, here's, a, here's one from uh, Peter Davidsey with a question embedded in it. Um, there is work done around, uh, around what is called ecocide, like genocide, a lobbying and action path to insert it in the crimes that can be judged by the International Criminal Court. Otherwise, there is discussion and negotiation at COP26 around the loss and damage compensation facility. The question is, do you see the Alliance as a parallel organization to the UN? Would this pose some further point in time in the future, the question of merging with the UN, um, like a police force? Well, again, excellent questions. Um, yes, I would see it as uh, an organization parallel to the UN, and hopefully they would be able to work together. Um, I mean, security is only the first objective. Hopefully the democracies could work together on other issues such as climate. So I think President Biden has advocated de democracies work together on climate. Um, maybe that would be an, an initial objective for them, but, but I think security is the most immediate one. Um, so yes, I, I can see it working together with the UN um, and strengthening the UN in its peacekeeping and peace building activities to start with. Co collaborating with it, perhaps on um, climate change, etc. Um, how what happens in the future is a bit hard to see. Um, the the organisations might merge eventually, or um, because it's much easier to change a community such as this by simply uh, putting up a new treaty. Um, our community might win out in the end and absorb the UN. But anyway, um, that's all probably many decades in the future, I'm afraid, before we reach the final destination. Um, what else was there? Yes, yeah, I'm, well. Okay, next question. Sorry. Okay, from Lee Davis, and she's asking, what is the chance that, that a major effect of uniting the democracies will be the uniting of the autocracies, setting up a major armed conflict between opposing forces? Right, well, that's a good question. I, I guess that ties into the question, would this set up a new Cold War, the, the democracies versus... Yeah, and let me, let me just cut in, if I may, because the next question um, seems to be related to that, just in a comment form. It says, you're not developing world governance but an us and them relationship. Uh, you do not talk about mediation and conciliation. So two, 
two different ways of looking at the same theme. I'm sorry, Chris, go ahead. Right, well, um, the danger is that, um, yes, we formally us versus them. Um, but as I say, we explicitly declare that we have no aggressive intentions towards the autocracies. Uh, we, we could only move with the authorization of the um, UN Security Council, and they have the power of veto, so that they, they can prevent that with a click of a button. Um, so we're no threat to them. So the, I mean, the Cold War between the West and the Soviet Union, both sides were in, afraid of being invaded by the other. And it turns out neither side had a real intention of, of any such invasion. Uh, in this case, we explicitly rule out any invasion by the democracies, um, any intervention against by the democracies against the autocracies. I'm afraid we're leaving it to their people to um, organize their affairs properly. Um, so if, if a Cold War breaks out, it's purely because of the autocracies' um, action. If, if they continue their aggression, that might result in the Cold War, but um, it wouldn't be from our side, if you like. So the idea is that this would be a powerful enough organization to deter any such aggression and keep the peace. Um, by all means, so I'm saying we should be active in peace building, peacekeeping, mediation, conciliation, all those things are great ideas. And um, yes, they should be uh, part of the program of the community. Okay, thank you. Time for, oh, one last what, question. What, one last question. Okay, well, it, it seems like this issue has touched the nerve uh, because the next question is on the same theme. You may not have more to say, but I'll read the question in case it triggers some additional comment from you. So this comes from Tad Daly. And the question is, if there was even serious movement in the direction you propose, Chris, there's no doubt that the two greatest non-democratic powers in the world today, Russia and China, would see this as a profound military threat to their own national security. It's inconceivable that they would do anything other than dramatically increase their own military buildups. So the perpetual arms race, as, as we World Federation advocates deplore, would almost certainly accelerate, not diminish. How does, the, how does that move us toward the elimination of armies and the abolition of war? Again, you may have said as much as you want, but there it is. I can just say again, yes. So again, we, we, the community would subject itself to the Security Council. So as far as um, that goes, we would be no threat to them. So how they react is up to them. Um, hopefully they would see sense. I mean, even put together, they're not going to be any match for this community if um, the major democracies unite. Um, they can cause all sorts of trouble, but hopefully they would be deterred from doing so because it would be madness on their part to undertake anything like that. Um, but we need to put up the stop sign. We need to say, stop, you can't do this. You know, you can't keep um, threatening Taiwan and Ukraine and what have you. Um, we could, I mean, we could discuss more of those questions. So maybe we could have um, referenda in Taiwan and Ukraine to see what the inhabitants would like to do. Would the Ukrainians or, or even the Eastern, what is it? Eastern Ukraine, would that like to unite with Russia? I mean, they may, maybe um, if the people want to do it, and I believe there are two different communities in Ukraine, maybe that would be a sensible move, but um, it shouldn't be done you know, by invas invasive force. So let's stick to peaceful means. Okay. So thank you, Chris, for your presentation. We're going to, in a moment, we're going to take a 10 minute break, but I wanted to check with you um, since right after the, or a few minutes after we come back, we'll be going into the breakout rooms. We, there, there are at least half a dozen more questions. 
would you be available to uh, be in that breakout room? I certainly would.